Welcome to another episode of To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Today, my guest, Paul Bordenkircher, local audio engineer. How you doing, Paul? Doing pretty good. One quiet day, not having music blasting in my ears. It's a good day. Yeah, we've been doing the <laughs> uh, the Rockstar Bar and Grill over yep. on Las Vegas Boulevard. Yep. That's been a fun little project to take over, man. Uh, you know, lots of good rock bands, getting to see a bunch of old friends again, man. Just oh. fun to, to be doing things again and, like, you know, have your brain not turn to jello from sitting around the last year. Yeah, for real, right? Like, it's just uh, it's a good feeling to be out there mixing music and putting on shows for people. Yes. So, and for me personally, like, uh, the rock star scene, I did a lot of stuff with, like, Vamped and, like, the 80s rockers. And so it feels like a high school reunion almost going to that place, man. I, I'm always running into, like, a dozen people that I haven't seen in forever and uh, and just the energy is so good, man. It feels really good. Yeah, it's a fun little room. It was kind of a surprise. Like I said, I got a call like last minute about, hey, we might need an audio guy. And it was, I think I literally ran down there the same night they called me just to see the situation. And then little did I know the next week, it was like, okay, you're it. Yeah. Well, you've been doing a phenomenal job of it too, man. Like your organization of everything and that binder you have for every little thing that you've been putting together for the club, man. I mean, that's, that's going above and beyond. And it really helps whenever you just go in there and you need some kind of information. Yeah. Well, it was easy. It was kind of duplicating the model I did at Gillies. It was always the thought that someday we all move on to other jobs. And it was, how do I set it up in such a way that anybody could come in, you know, or if I need a day off, we we train in new people that it, it makes it an easy transition. So I just really replicated that model. But then of course, your help with, with dialing in the PA and, and really getting things set up uh, in a in a really optimized way. It was it's been incredible. Nothing but rave reviews ever since then. Yeah, that was fun. I haven't gotten my hands on a big system in a while, so I was stoked to go in there and tear it apart and put it in properly and tune it and you know get those mics nice and hot, man. It was great. Yeah, I had a lot of fun, man. So uh, yeah, but you've been doing this for a while, right? I know you used to have your own studio and uh, you grew up out in what Fargo and. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in the frozen north of Fargo, and the joke I was is, yes, I had the accent too. We we <laughs> all did, just like the movie. They weren't. It wasn't an exaggeration. In fact, the funny uh, funny story there: the woman, the wife in the movie that gets kidnapped, she went to theater school with my sister at the same college I went to. So it was oh, like fun. local casting. They didn't make up the accent. Yeah, we all we all had that accent. So I went to school for this. I went to school for studio recording. That was the initial thing. Like so many of us were. Yeah. And then life evolves from there and you end up somewhere else. Yeah. Studio recording doesn't exactly make a lot of money, especially if you're not the one who owns the studio. You know, that's a low paying gig for someone with a college degree. Yeah. And I mean, when we got into it, you know, and this is basically early 90s, late 80s. It was we didn't see the change coming. There was this little thing called Pro Tools that nobody really knew anything about yet. And, you know, it literally wiped out so many people out of the industry, wiped so many studios off the map. I mean, even people like Lady Gaga do 90% of their stuff at home on a laptop, then take it into a studio for final finishing. So yeah. th there's just no need for as many big rooms as there used to be. So it's it became a really tough market and you evolve and you change. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I, I used to do so many different bands in my home studio, and now it's really it's few and far between when I'm doing any kind of musical thing besides my own music. It's a lot of just commercial production, and I've been trying to get into uh, doing uh, audio books and stuff like that, you know, anything to use the studio equipment to make a little bit of cash on the side. Absolutely. I've, I've done one uh, audio book myself, and I've done voiceovers on and off through the years just like you have. So it's it's just you do, you adapt, you change, you you roll with the punches and whatever this industry throws at you. Yeah. Now, you did a lot of uh, stuff in uh, the Christian music scene. Your wife was a singer, right? Yep, yep. It was, um, again, part of that transition. I moved to Nashville and uh, after college, and unbeknownst to me, it wasn't like the places I interned because I originally interned in New York City and Minneapolis. And in both of those cities, they were what I'd call staff towns. Second engineers and a lot of the crew worked for the studio. They were paid by the studio. Well, when I moved to Nashville, Nashville was what you'd like L.A. It was a freelancer town. Like everybody freelanced into rooms and into things. I didn't really know anybody. I didn't know the rooms. So I floundered. 
in that. And then out of that, there was an opportunity to go to work for a Christian record label. And ultimately, I've been in in and out of certain ways of Christian music almost for the next 20 years after that. But it was a it was a major label out of Nashville, and I worked there for a while. And then I got an opportunity to work for a big label that was outside of Nashville, and saw a lot of stuff that was not cool. Yeah, you know, you, you would have figured uh, Christian music would have been a more en- enlightened type of experience and stuff. And long story short, what I figured out is they're just as bad as the other side. Yeah, business is business, especially when it comes to making money with people's art. You know, it's like. It's really cutthroat and uh, greedy kind of uh, environment when you get down to it. In many ways, it's even worse because people who come in, like the artists and the creators, often have that heart of ministry. I just want to serve. I want to bless people. I want to whatever. Yeah. And the business side is just like, we're just going to take advantage of whatever we can. That's always been the case, you know, from my experience, man, is everyone's just going to take advantage of the situation as much as possible. Yeah. yeah, and we we found it so distasteful that at some point when I left the the second label, uh, my wife and I helped a local church there start an independent label. So we did everything from scratch, everything from UPC codes to copyrights to starting our own publishing company from scratch to, when I say recording studio, it's like an iMac with an interface. But it was our studio, and we did a couple, you know, handful of projects with that. So we, we started all from scratch to try to break that paradigm of that abuse and so forth. And long story short, over time, it really didn't work out because so much in the industry was evolving. Yeah. And, we, you know, small church, not a big budget. We had a hard time, you know, keeping up with it. Yeah, it is rough, man. Like you were saying, with uh, with the advent of Pro Tools and being able to just record off your laptop with a small interface at this point, it's like the, the studio game's really been hit hard by that whole experience, man. Yeah, and, and you know, in there in the middle of that was the switch to mp3s and digital downloads and then of course ultimately the streaming and and the rand the drastic shift in business models just made it hard to keep up and if you weren't well found, uh, funded and well you know backed by something it just made it really difficult to to stay in it oh yeah i don't think i've ever made profit on an album i've done you know it's, i've always i sold a bunch of copies of the record or like even you know sold on itunes and everything like that but it's like the amount of money and time that it goes into producing an album to compared to what you actually make off of it in the back end is just, it's insignificant, man. And yep. uh, yeah, it was always about just merch sales and getting paid for your actual performance is where you only, it's the only place you're ever going to make any money, it seems like nowadays. Well, and I remember doing an interesting seminar when I was teaching at UNLV. We brought in a guy who was a big consultant for people like, I'm trying to remember, it was like Warrant, Loverboy, like a lot of 80s bands that were coming back after the oh, whole yeah. alternative thing and trying to trying to bake it back. And he was like, his, his big first question was like, yeah, there's all this stuff now. At that point, it was still MySpace. He's like, and then there's digital downloads and there's this and there's that. What's, you know, what's a, a band supposed to do? How are they supposed to do it? And he goes, it's exactly the same as it ever was. You have to get out. You have to play. You have to meet people where they're at. He goes, and that's how you build a fan base. And literally to this day, that's still when I tell independent acts that are trying to build. It's like you've got to make that face-to-face. You've got to make that personal connection. Then the streams. Then the merch sales. Then the other things follow behind that. But you got to put on a great live show and you got to tour a lot. Yeah. you got to be, uh, you got to be out there for people to, like, discover you. You know, playing a show once a month isn't going to cut it, you know, and and you have to go out and play to smaller venues and do all this, you know, uh, what's it called? Paying your dues, right? And you learn your craft. You learn yeah. which pieces of music or the way that you write, which things respond with the audience, which things don't. You know, the good ones are looking at that and getting the feedback every night from their shows and adjusting what they do, you know, within their own, you know, you got to be true to yourself. But sometimes just a matter of how you write a song or how the songs respond. And that helps, in fact, develop yourself as an artist. Yeah. Now, I always uh, I always like to talk about uh, when I was uh, working with Imagine Dragons and watching them come up, man, they were playing like three, four nights a week. And they were paying their bills, doing cover songs and sneaking their songs in. And then, you know, they hit the road as soon as they could possibly afford to. And they just, they played and played and played and played and played and they did nothing but promote that project over and over again. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, they got great songs and it's like, that's like what the industry was looking for was that kind of sound. But uh, it, it wasn't because 
it's not because you're the best songwriter. It's because you put in the hard work and you really grind and you really put yourself out there over and over and over again. That really leads to the success. Well, what's that saying about, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to get really good at anything. I mean, it's an old cliche, but in the case of music and, you know, in the case of just mastering an instrument, but also as developing an act, developing a sound, a style, a, a chemistry with your band members. It's still the same thing. It's still that 10,000 hours. you got to put in the time to hit that spot where it gels. And, yeah, the fact is not everybody gels. Things don't always work out. Oh, yeah. Certain personnel don't work out. Or it's, you know, right, you know, great songs, great people, but the wrong timing. You know, that was always the big story. about. I always got used to get mad almost about the overblown hype of Nirvana. Yeah. Because, yeah, they were a huge thing. They, they radically changed the industry very quickly. But it wasn't that necessarily that they were so brilliant they were good of course but it was right song right style right place right time we were all sick of hair metal oh yeah you know steel heart and firehouse and some of those late hair metal bands you were just like god is this all we got left and this came along and then it just wiped all of that out and suddenly we had a new thing so it was it was a combination of a lot of things it was it was you, you still have better odds of buying a lottery ticket than becoming the next nirvana oh yeah but that doesn't mean anybody's going to stop doing it and and thank god we want new music we want new creativity we want all those things and it's just you got to put in the time people try to shortcut it with social media and and doing those things and those are helpful those are pieces to the puzzle but the truth the core of the puzzle is still your art your artistry your songs your whatever uh chemistry with the group or and that kind of thing and then getting lucky with right place right time yeah and like the social media thing's a trip because nowadays uh when you're going to get signed by a, a label they already want to see the hard work done you know they want to know that when they're signing you you have ten thousand uh, followers you know or whatever and that you already have this fan base that they're buying into and it's like at that point what do i even need the label for i already have 10,000 people following me and I'm only going to, sh- I'm going to stream it on Spotify anyways. Right. And sell it on. And what are you bringing to the table as a label? Uh, and there's becomes that issue where the label's like, yeah, but why am I going to waste my time growing you? You know, if you're not going to put in the hard work yourself and, uh, and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a weird thing to, to get your name out there. It is. And, and as much as I have a distaste for labels and how they work at the same time, I've also, the longer I've done this, understood where the business model came from. Like there was one instance I had an, uh, an artist playing at Gillies when I was there and he's a guy from Las Vegas who moved to Nashville to become an artist. So he's in the thick of it. So every time he comes back, I kind of pick his brain about what's going on, what's happening. And it just so happened we had another artist that was coming in. It, I think it was uh, National Finals Rodeo, which, of course, you know, is a big thing here in Las Vegas in December. So we were bringing in this name act. And I was telling him, oh, yeah, they've got a they've got a number nine hit on the charts this week or whatever. And he's, you know, putting his gear together. He's like, oh, that's another million like yeah. that. And I'll go, OK, stop. You, you can't just say that to me and then not explain. Now, OK, explain. So Scotty goes through and says, OK, to have a top 40 country radio hit you're going to spend $1 million yeah. between promotions and whatever and this and that. Well, you're, you're buying it from Clear Channel. Yeah, you have to get in. And I have a whole long story about that whole thing and when that whole universe turned into a closed loop. Yeah. I remember the exact day, but that's another story. Um, but he explained, so top 40 is $1 million. Top 10 is another million. A number one country hit is another million yeah so just thinking of one country artist one hit you want it to go number one the label is going to spend three million dollars that's and now can you imagine what the top 40 expenses it's probably five million Mm -hmm. per single we're not even talking albums we're not talking touring we're talking literally just spending that money so in in that sense i understand why they're so restrictive and why they sign copycat bands and why Because their business model is so whacked. It isn't the 70s where they sign anything that sounds cool, knowing that one out of 10 might do something. They don't do that anymore. That's where that's where you got great bands from, you know, these amazing bands that were they that sounded unique and had their own kind of vibe to them, man, because people were taking chances. It's like Zappa. Nobody would ever sign Frank Zappa, but he's a friggin legend. Right. I mean. Yeah, and artist development in this in this time period in the last three years has also evaporated. Like we're talking about, they're they're looking for bands that already have an email list of eighty thousand. You know, so many viewers on Instagram and blah blah and those kinds of things because they want something built already. They want a sound, a style, so they just 
glom onto it. Essentially, I always tell artists, the only time you need, when you need a major record label is when you need more money and more access. Yeah. And even the money's dicey. I heard a story about another major country artist going back to the Gilly days who came to the record label with $1 million of backing. So it wasn't just, hi, I'm a talented artist, come sign me. It was, I have this and I have somebody who's going to fund my tour, my album, my this for the first million dollars that we do. So it's not even just signing a talented person anymore. It's literally coming in with a business package yeah. to even get there. So again, the business model continues to evolve and change. You have to bring more to the table. Again, the days of Motown teaching their artists how to meet queens and what the forks on all the table, like in the Titanic mean and all that, those days are gone. They expect you to come in complete finished package, usually even finished masters. So they're not even spending money on your records. Oh, yeah. So it's, a, again, the model keeps shifting, and we, artists just have to keep evolving. But the thing that doesn't change is good songs, good chemistry, touring and, and connecting with people. That's always the core of it. Never changed. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's the truth, man. And with uh, and once you get involved with Clear Channel, you know, they're going to make sure that your song is heard at least once an hour, every hour, for weeks on end. You know, And once somebody's heard that song three or four times, you, you know, your brain starts to glom on and attach to that song and you start to like it regardless of how much it sucks or how much you didn't like it initially it becomes this repetition pattern and your brain likes pattern it's a pattern recognition software that's running in your brain and so they they know this and they're just gonna they take the million dollars and they just force feed it to everybody and they put it in movies and they put it in tv shows and they just you're gonna hear that song you know 10 20 times in the next year easily yeah, and, it, and it's also they've changed some of the monetization. You know, yeah. when we were younger, there's no way you'd hear a Queen song in a television commercial. There's just no way. It wouldn't oh, happen. Yeah. You know, in the days of uh, Bob Seger having like a rock and Chevy, he was getting $10 million a year for using that song. Now I see Queen in a dog food commercial. Yeah. You know, a $40,000 budget, and they'll, they'll get a Queen song where, you know, even 10 years ago, if you were going to get an artist like that, it's a seven-figure budget or, or, you know, or more. And so that has changed. So they've started going after what I call the little money. That was the thing where independents could make some money. They could get it in a BMW car commercial or they could get it in a, this kind of thing or in the background of a movie. And so they'd make ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year and be perfectly happy with that. Well, now the labels are grabbing that money too. That's why there's you know, ACDC in an Applebee's commercial <laughs> because they're just grabbing every dollar they can get their hands on. And so, again, the model shifts and we have to shift with it. Yeah, it's crazy, man. So uh, I see here, uh, tell me the real story of Bon Jovi's signing. <laughs> okay. So crazy story. I, of course, I'm going to school in Fargo. So I'm a little farm boy at a recording program in school. And uh, I know I, this is what I want to do. I want to mix records. I want to be that kind of guy. And just so happened I had a trip going to New York. I think there was a music business students convention or something out there. So I rip a page out of the phone book, the New York City phone book in our school library, and I just start calling. I, I, names I've heard of, like there was a Song Kitchen or some Hit Factory and so on. And I knew the name Power Station. So I just called them up and said, hey, I'm going to be in New York next month or whatever. Can I come in and interview for an internship this summer? Well, I'd gotten a clue from another studio where I got turned down, and they said, hey, you know, if you want to get an internship at one of these places, tell them you want to do a maintenance internship because everybody wants to be a, an engineer or a mixer or whatever. And that actually got me in the door there. So unbeknownst to me, Power Station was started by a guy named Tony Bon Jovi who was, of course, John's uncle. Now, uh, Tony has an amazing story, because when he was a kid, he was a studio rat in New York. He's a guy who would sneak in the back door, poke his head in, and watch records being made, and so on and so forth. Then he had a little two-track at home that he would screw around with and try to you know, see the things that he's seen come home and do them. Well, one day, he's about 16 or 17 years old. He comes back into the studio one day and goes, hey, listen to this. And he had basically replicated the Motown sound on his little two track at his house. <laughs> so as the story goes, Tony's entire senior high school was handing notes to his teacher saying, please excuse Tony for the next two weeks. He's gonna be in Detroit mixing for Motown. Ah. So Tony was this wonderkin, this prodigy, um, and he was mixing ever since, like I said, before he got out of high school. So he was well connected in all the industry and so forth. So as he got older, he bought his own studio. He built the power station in New York, which was an old electric like substation or something along those lines. So it was an industrial building. And he got into the business of wanting to produce acts. 
So he'd bring them in. I mean, he'd do everything from like fix their teeth to get them haircuts, to get a medical care. I mean, everything in exchange for a big cut once he breaks them. Well, his little nephew, John, who's mopping and sweeping the floors became one of his projects. So he's working on demos and stuff in there. And I saw him in the vault downstairs starting from about 1979 or 1980 of stuff when they were working with him. Well, even with all of Tony's connections, he was taking his demo and he was pitching it at all the label people, all his contacts. Again, he's mixing for Motown. He's got ins. And he pitched him everywhere and got nowhere. So in New York City, of course, they have the big rock station. I believe it was called K-Rock at the time. They have a local band's contest. Send us your demo tapes, and we'll, we'll play them on the air, and we'll judge them, and the, the winner has a chance for a record deal. Well, let me see. Everybody else with an 8-track in their garage sending in tapes, or Tony Bon Jovi mixing your song at the power station. Well, guess who won? Yeah. So, believe it or not, Runaway was the demo that they sent to the radio station, and because of the contest, that's how John got his deal. Oh, Wow. So and that so then you know history from there. But it was so it was literally even with all those connections, nobody wanted to sign John, and it was the radio station contest that put him through. That's crazy. So crazy story. Not a lot of people know it. Yeah, I didn't know that about John Bon Jovi, man. So yeah, and uh, yeah, I remember getting into uh, the studio days too, man. I was just like I had to go scrub toilets and and make coffee and get food for people just to shut up. And sit in the back of the room and don't say anything, and you're lucky to be here right now, you know? Yeah, well, it's hard to get in the music industry. And when I got into Power Station, of course, it was still the tape days. So it was the big, you know, multi tracks and, you know, a lot of and mostly analog equipment, you know? So that was the thing. So with that maintenance internship, the very first yeah. day, I was aligning Studer 24 track decks and I was, you know, doing Freon back when we had Freon and clean the faders. And so I was touching everything within the first week. No, oh, that's awesome. Now the equivalent would be how good is your, you know, IP networking and how much do you know Mac and Windows and viruses and, you know, they'd be the same thing. You do it today and maybe that's still in at some big rooms. I really have no idea anymore. Well, it is nice to have a big analog desk and a Studer tape machine and you just run it through the Studer and then play the Studer back into Pro Tools and once you have your tracks ready to go. Yep. And then you get that nice big analog sound. I mean, if you run if you run your uh, audio through an S uh, SSL 9000J into a Studer, I mean, <laughs> you know, you don't have to be the smartest engineer in the world. You're going to sound like you know what you're doing. Yeah, and there, I know there was a studio here in town at one point that had like a tape machine and they literally owned one roll of tape. Yeah. So you'd, t you'd track your stuff into the tape machine, you dump it back out, and you just erase the tape, and the next guy used the same tape. Brutal. So, because, you know, who's going to spend $400 on a reel of, of magnetic tape when you're never going to use it again? Yeah. So that was somewhere. I don't know if that studio is still in business. Uh, well, uh, I was working at Digital Insight, and we had, uh, I wasn't a studer. It was, uh, I, it I might have just been like a Tascam 24 channel or something like that. But uh, we had the, the tape machine, and we would beg people to pay to use the tape machine <laughs> and run it through uh, the analog console that we had. Because it was, I mean, the, it was basically just for playback, the analog console that we had. And... Uh, yeah, we, we never really got to do it. We we hooked it up and we you know dialed it all in. Me and uh, my buddy Mike Lavin, and uh, nobody would ever go through the process of paying to record the tape, man. Uh, and it's such a wonderful sound, especially it when is. you when you tweak the settings and you get more tape compression happening, and you know do those kinds of things. It's it's really is nice to hear. And it's when you do hear an old record or you do hear something that's done that way, it's like, wow, okay, I remember that. Yeah, it makes a huge difference, man. It really does. It's like uh, it's like capturing, uh, you know, photography on film. It's the same way you can take these old uh, masters of movies that were shot in the 70s, but they were shot on film, and it's just capturing light. It's not capturing so many megapixels, right? It's, right. It's, it's, it's capturing light on film. So you can, you can take that and render that as HD footage almost. It looks amazing. I mean, I mean, look at what they did with Star Wars. If you watch the original 77 cuts of Star Wars and you watch the, the Blu-ray or 4K versions of Star Wars now, I mean, it's, it's night and day, yeah. but it's the same exact film. Because it's real, it's capturing, it's capturing the mo realest form of things, man. Yeah, audio is doing the same thing. And that difference between analog and digital. Analog, mm -hmm. there's no breaks in it, and there are issues with digital and sampling and issues, you know, that way. There can be minor issues, just having that analog signal. So film is just the visual analog, and and it makes so much difference. Oh yeah, it really does, man. 
I did get to track um, one album, which was one of the first albums I ever did at um, this dude who was part of Parliament or Pavement. Pavement was the band that he was in. And he had this crazy studio in his backyard. Uh, and it was a really nice studio, but he had analog tape. And uh, yeah, it was nice. The album that we recorded sucked. I mean, I was like 15 or something like that. It was just a terrible metal album. But we were we had the opportunity to go in and jam on uh, jam on some tape. Uh, I think we had one more opportunity too before everything just digitized. The second the band right after that we did in some guy's garage, and he had a two inch tape machine, and it was just it's the coolest thing, man, to see it spinning and all the individual channels on the huge console as opposed to like what I have here. You can see I have just like the little you know eight motorized faders and. You know, I have a bunch of preamplifiers and stuff everywhere, but it's all, it's all in the box. It's yep. all in the box. That's not a console. That's just a over a over glorified mouse. That's just controlling Pro Tools, you know, with faders and knobs instead of a mouse. And don't get me wrong, it does a great job on and many most things. But yeah, the if you've grown up with that or you know that experience of vinyl, oh, I had I had one. My wife and I took a trip to visit uh, my sister up in Minneapolis. And the Airbnb we stayed in had a turntable in it, and they had a collection of old records in there. That was kind of the, the vibe of the place. And I pulled out Fleetwood Max Rumors and Dreams on Vinyl. I just don't think it can ever be replicated anywhere else. It was so smooth. It was so sweet. And I just kept playing it the whole time we were there. Vinyl's a big deal, man. Yeah, I, I get it. After hearing that, it was like, wow, I can really get where certain records just just fly off the vinyl like that. Yeah, we have, I don't know if you noticed, in uh, in the dining room there, we have a whole record player. We have Technique and a little mixer and some JBL speakers hooked up and it's just a huge collection of vinyl underneath. And it's nice, like, I, you know, I have Spotify and, and I have the, the Alexa units that, that play any song I can possibly imagine. But, you know, it's a compressed MP3. And yep. even if you play it on a CD, it sounds like you're like, oh, that's what it's supposed to sound like kind of thing. <laughs> but when you go all the way back to vinyl... Uh, there's just this beautiful sound that comes out of it, man. And, of course, you get the pops and the clicks. Some people like the pops and the clicks. I don't give a shit either way, you know. Right, I mean, I right. know it's going to come with it. But it's like that uncompressed, uh, I mean, still compressed, but that, that raw sound of the vinyl is just, it really makes a huge difference, man. And it's nice to be responsible for the spinning disc because, you know, 15, 20 minutes from now, you're going to have to flip that thing over. Yep. And, you know, or your, your music session is over. It's, it, it has come to an end. And, yeah, it's, uh, so you, you're paying attention to the songs. It's more, of a, it's more of the act of, like, really listening and participating in the process of the music playing as opposed to just being on in the background. And, and I still remember the times as a kid when you'd, you'd have the money for a record, and there's something about carrying that 12 by 12 or whatever the size the package is and bring that home, and it was the day was shot. The earphones went on, you sat there, you <laughs> read everything in the vinyl. You know, if you got one that had all the lyrics and the credits on the inside, and you lived with that album for like days and days. Oh, yeah. And now that's one of my my complaints about the digital, even going back to MP3 downloads. You know, one of the things like when Apple started the iTunes stores, they didn't insist on that you had to buy albums. Yeah. And that was partly a beef because, you you know, before that it was $20 for a CD and there'd be two good songs and 11 shitty ones and you were like why did i spend all this money so itunes turned it into a singles driven business where previous to that i mean again we probably all have favorite albums and it wasn't just that it was these 10 songs it was also had to do with the order they were in yeah and and it was like in many ways they told a story i mean things like you know tommy from the who or or operation mind crime was one of my favorites in college and it's telling a story so to listen to track nine and then three and then six and then two, it just it's not the same experience. So a lot of this this generation, listen to me sound like an old guy, but this generation old guys now. doesn't know the experience of, of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes of it's an experience that the album takes you across. Yeah. And it's sad because I, I'm, I'm very um, honest and maybe even self-deprecating about my own skills, knowledge, experience, and all those kinds of things. But there's one thing I can say I was always really good at, which and that was sequencing records. So the independent records and stuff that I worked on, it was always like putting songs together in a certain order or whatever was, was always one of my fortes. And now nobody cares. 
Yeah. That's a skill set that just doesn't resonate with anybody anymore. I like the transition between the songs. Are you going to leave a two-second gap? Are you going to kind of crossfade the outro of the song into the intro of the next song? And All like that, that whole process, it just it brings this vibe to the final product of the album as opposed to just like, here's a single. But it comes down to monetization too, right? Like I, uh, I spent some time working with Adelita's Way, and I believe they just were like, we're so sick of doing albums and putting all this effort in for no real return. They're like, we've been doing just a single, releasing a single, mm-hmm. putting a lot of effort into the one song, and the return uh, from our efforts is just it's it's so much greater. And they're like, we're just gonna do it this way, man. You know, we have we have a a list of songs and you know back back catalog of albums that we can play from and then moving forward it's like we'll just keep dropping these singles and not waste a huge amount of money putting an album out that's not really going to do anything we're going to sell the one or two songs that gets promoted properly off the album anyways right and that goes back to the model of itunes sort of destroying the album model labels still work on that album model and it doesn't make any sense so i i think as far back as 2005 i would tell independent acts stop making albums release singles, put them out one at a time, build your fan base based on that, see which songs respond. Okay, write more songs like the ones that really, you know, they respond to and and move along those lines. And then if you want to, you can compile 10 or 12 of them onto a CD. Now you have an album. You can sell it at stores or concerts. Of course, again, the CD model is virtually gone anyway. But at concerts, it was always the CD became something else. Even early on, it became more of a memento of what you just experienced. And I I remember seeing bands like uh, Matchbox 20 did it, and there was a couple others where they would record the shows, and then they would stop, they would do the encore, and while in that in-between time, they would run back to the booth with a flash drive, they would copy it, and you would leave that night with that show on a flash drive. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. That's the souvenir experience. So CDs became the souvenir kind of a thing. And again, it's a way to, for bands to make money, but it's also that thing of, I've got this, I was there at this show, and so on and so forth. And it became like more of a thing. So I do, I tell bands all the time, stop making albums. Yeah. Nobody cares about albums anymore. Make singles, catch fire, and then worry about longer things. And I heard somebody else say, singles are for newbies, albums are for fans. Yeah. Fans will buy 12 songs. Newbies of just figuring you out are going to buy one here, one there. Yeah. There's certain there's certain acts out there. Like, for, for me, anything that Les Claypool does, a huge fan, anything he puts out, I will just buy. The yes. whole album, day it comes out, he's got my money. No questions asked, you know? And I'm, gonna, and I'm never disappointed with that decision. Everything he puts out is great for me personally. And... Uh, yeah, I I don't even question it at all. But like other other acts, I'll listen to their stuff on Spotify, or you know, I won't even. I, I feel like I should contribute more money to them, but it's like I got it on Spotify, so why do I care? You know, right? Um, and new acts, you don't know, you're gonna try yeah. them out. Yeah, you're gonna try one song, you're gonna see, oh, I like that one. Okay, the second one's good. Okay, the third one's crap. I'm not listening to them anymore. Yeah. So you're done. You didn't make the the twenty dollar commitment for a twelve song CD you don't care about. But you you get into it, and that's how we build fans. That's back to the being out one at a time, one person at a time, one show at a time, one single at a time. Yeah. That always hurt back in the day when you go out and spend eighteen ninety nine on a record, and then it just sucks. <laughs> it's got that song you heard on the radio, and you're yep. like, this is going to kill. And then you get, you get home, and there's just, yeah, 13 songs of garbage. I'm trying to think of the one. I think it was... I think it was Vanessa Carlton. She had the Million Miles or whatever, Thousand Miles song. Yeah. That was a great song. My wife bought the CD, didn't care about anything else on the record. It was the <laughs> one song. And that, that was, again, the beginning of iTunes, the beginning of the, the singles mentality. And it's, it's, it's always a way to go for artists now. Like I said, I just, that's all I ever tell them now. One song at a time. Yeah, man. You know, focus a lot of effort and, uh, and get something quality out there. That's really where it comes down to, yep. man. Yep. So what is your one major label credit I see we have here? Oh, yes. While I was working at uh, Paisley Park, yes, Prince's studio, I was there. Uh, I will clarify, I worked at the studio. I did not work with Prince. I was just there. But I happened to be there during the Batman soundtrack. Oh, awesome. Or right as it was getting, the movie was getting finished. So that's another great story about studios. But um, it was a local band. Um, Their name was Trip Shakespeare. And they were doing their first uh, album for, I think it was A&M Records or something. And they had Fred Marr producing, which was like Lou Reed's guy. 
And uh, so I got to be in there for about two months. So I'm on, I was on probably nine or 10 of the 12 songs on the project. And uh, so that's my one and only credit. It sold a grand total of 35,000 units. Nice. So I always would, I tell my students about it. Yes, I've been in the studio. Yes, I have a major label album credit. It sold 35,000 units. Don't be impressed. Nobody cares. It's the Batman soundtrack. But it was a great, it was a great album. I still love the band. And ultimately the one guy in it became a uh, semi-sonic we all play closing time at the end of the bar. Oh yeah! At the end of the night, and uh, and ultimately he wrote for Adele and a bunch of other people. So I sure wish I'd have kept in touch with him. But that's that's my literally my one and only studio credit. <laughs> but the the interesting thing when I was working at Paisley Park was I learned about the superstitious nature of major studio recording. And at that time, I started there interning there probably in late 88, something like that. Uh, this was in the period after Purple Rain. Purple Rain built Paisley Park. That was where the money came from. But he did Under the Cherry Moon, and then it was like the Around the World in the Day album. And so on. so he was in kind of a slump. So it was this big, amazing, at that time, I think it was a $10 million facility, and there was virtually nobody in it. It would be Prince would be in there working on stuff, and occasionally one of the other rooms would be booked out. Well, like I said, when I started there, he was finishing the Batman record. Well, that same summer it came out, also an album from the Fine Young Cannibals came out. And if you remember that summer, they were number one and number two on the Billboard album charts. When I went back to work for uh, Paisley Park that fall, all three rooms in that studio were booked for two years straight. Nice. There was no getting in there because suddenly the industry went, oh, there's the sound. We have to go to Paisley Park. We have to. And it's this weird superstition that they don't want to record at a place that hadn't had a hit yet. Yeah. And so, and it, it's everywhere. You There's stories about Elvis and the, the studio he recorded at. And how did they get that sound? And they measured everything and they did everything. I've heard different stories. One was that they just invented tape echo for his recordings. The other one was supposedly there was, it was on a second floor. The Sun Records studio was on second floor. And there was a stairway down to the ground floor and they'd leave that door open when they hmm. record as well. So it's, you know, who knows? I don't know what the true story is, but it, there's always been this weird superstition. They don't want to record with you until you've had a hit. Yeah. It's like uh, how Dave Grohl bought that console and took it to his studio and there was that whole documentary yeah, on that. Uh, all I, those artists recorded I, on it. I would say it wrong. Is it Studio City? Sound City? Yeah, I think Sound it, City. I think yeah, it was I think Sound, Sound City. City, yeah. Yeah, it was, a it was a terrible place. I knew a guy from L.A. who was like, yeah, they had like the horrible tacky uh, uh, carpet hanging on all over the walls to make it cheap. And I, oh, they recorded Metallica there. And he's like, yeah, because they ran out of money. Yeah. So they went there because it was cheap. They could get in for like 200 a day or something like that. So it, it has this legendary thing because it was a cheap room and just they got lucky a few times. Yeah. You know, you don't really, uh, it doesn't have to be a million dollars worth of equipment to make a good sounding record, man. You know, as, as long as you got good quality stuff going in and at least a decent enough preamp and converter and microphone, you know, if the band's bringing it and they know how to tune their drums and they have a good sounding drum kit, you know, you got to just, you slap mics on that sucker and it's going to sound good. You know? Yeah. And I've heard this story over and over too. The best records were made when the parameters were limited. Yeah. They had limited time. They had a limited number of tracks. They had a limited amount of money. You know, whatever. The first Van Halen record was, what, seven days? The second Van Halen record was like two weeks. Um, you know, you have those. Or you limit the number of tracks. So you have to suddenly get creative with your equipment, with your time management, with your this and that. And if you don't, if you have unlimited money, unlimited tracks, unlimited whatever, you get Chinese democracy. Yeah, I was just about to say, you know, it's like... <laughs> Then you're, you're sitting there mixing a record for 10 years, and it sucks anyways. Right. I remember uh, Dr. Pepper came out and said, we're going to give free Dr. Peppers to everyone in America if Chinese conspiracy comes out in whatever yeah. year it was. I don't remember. Oh, it. yeah. And I think it finally did, but it was 15 years in the making. And that's what happens when you have that's unlimited crazy. money, unlimited resources, unlimited, and you get nothing. Yeah. I get, I'll get bands that want to come in the studio, and they want me to give them a song rate. And I was just like, It'll, I'm never, ever going to do a song rate for anybody, because I've done that before. Or like thousand bucks and I'll, you know, I'll do like a, a demo, you know, three, four songs for you or whatever. And then it's like, okay, well now you have Axl Rose in your studio who wants to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again, all freaking day long. And, uh, and now you're like a week into a project where it should have been like three or four days of just banging it out. And, uh, and people will go crazy. They will go literally insane. If you don't put a time limit and you say, this is how long we're going to do it. That was good enough. Let's move on because really how many more times we got to do this thing? It sounded like it sounds when you do it live, right? You're going to get, or how are you going to become better than what you are? 
or right. do it absolutely perfect. Perfection never occurs, even well, in the studio. And especially with new bands, you're trying to catch the vibe. It yeah. isn't about catching this perfected sound. That's what bands that have been around for 20 years, you're a Pink Floyd, you're whatever, but if you're a new band in town, like Imagine Dragons getting started, you catch the vibe. People are either going to dig the vibe or not. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, yeah, so uh, that's definitely one word of advice to anybody who's doing a recording studio. Don't do a song rate. <laughs> no. Or I would tell them song rate with a caveat of number of hours. Yeah. So, okay, it's 1000 bucks a song, 30 hours max, or yeah. whatever you happen to say. You know, you put a limit on it because, like you say, otherwise it's the never-ending project. Oh, yeah. And, and from what I've learned also, Christian bands can be the worst. Oh, I bet. At that. Absolutely the worst because they want everything and want to pay nothing. And those are the acts that usually don't pay the bills either. And you spend the most time on them. Ugh. And every studio has that issue. They have the problem child, and then they have the guy that just comes in, pays cash or pays well, and he's in and out. Yeah, man. I was like, you can't, uh, it gets to the point where you, you don't, I, I don't give people their own music until they paid me in full for what we've done up to that point. Not even demos, man. Oh, yeah. We would we would include like white noise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I want a rough. Okay, well, here. Yeah. And there's some... Okay, this will give you the idea, and it isn't finished. So it's my best way to, like, uh, watermark them or whatever so they couldn't use them. Yeah, definitely. Like, with music videos, when you're doing that kind of stuff, you can put, like, sample all, uh, you know, uh, reduce the opacity of the word sample and put it up over there, unfin you know? Yep, yep. And then it's like, you can't put that out anywhere. Yep. You know, you got to give me the money, I'll take that off, <laughs> and then you got your music video. Because people are just bone you on that big time, you know? It's crazy. Uh, it, you haven't owned a studio if it hasn't happened to you at least once. Yeah. Yeah, and it's ridiculous, man. That's funny. Well, uh, let's see here. I know you're big into electric vehicles, and you were telling me some cool stuff about uh, about benefits of electric vehicles, and you belong to an electric vehicle club. Yeah, here in town they have the Las Vegas Electric Vehicle Association, and it's basically an advocacy group for electric vehicles, electrification, and, of course, it that dovetails really well into things like solar power and renewable energy. A lot of EV drivers end up having solar panels on their home or, you know, those kinds of things. So it caveats into a few other things. But when I moved back to Vegas, uh, Christmas 2018, I needed a second car. And, you know, the, the three years in Alabama didn't go so well. So it was kind of strapped for cash. And it was like I just sat down and crunched the numbers of, of trying to find an inexpensive car. Yeah, I know I could buy a $2,000 beater, but how much am I going to spend on fixing it and keeping it running and all that? So I looked at something that was decent, logical, and maintenance and X, Y, and Z. And the more I, I pared it down, the more electric vehicles made more sense. Now, in my case, I couldn't afford a Tesla. I couldn't afford the, the new ones are all 30, 40, 70, 80,000. So my big soapbox when we do our events and whatever I was talk about used electric vehicles because I don't know if it's just not out there or not a lot of people are talking about it, but people who are EV enthusiasts who are really into it, they get the cars, but they buy them most commonly on a three year lease because they, in three years from now, they want the better battery, better range, sexier features, whatever it happens to be. And so there's this whole market of used three-year-old electric vehicles that are uh, keep spilling out on the market every year. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, cell phones, right? You're always going to upgrade your cell phone every two to three years just to keep the up with the latest and greatest things. Exactly. And these are people that have the money. Well, the dirty secret of that is because those people are turning them over, the resale value on them in that first three years drops dramatically. So my car was roughly just shy of 27,000 new. I got it three years old, 26,000, 28,000 miles on it, and it was 10. Now, and mine was a certified pre-owned, so I had extra warranties. I could have bought my car for eight. So literally two-thirds of the value came off the car in those first three years. Now, everything's just as good. The battery shows a little wear, just like your your phone battery would. But in every other function, it's, it's like having a new car. And Almost every brand except Tesla's have this this issue where the, the value drops over three years. So now that thirty thousand dollar car is ten, or the forty thousand dollar car is twelve, and so it's it, it, they're incredibly valuable, uh, you know, a value thing at that three years, and the maintenance is next to non-existent. I've had my car two and a half years now. I've literally not done a single thing to it, except maybe I think I put washer fluid in it. So I've spent a dollar thirty nine <laughs> in my car, and that's so, awesome. So it's it's a lot of things. I I tell other guys about it. If we if it's just something you need in town, you know, a short range one. Mine only goes eighty miles on a charge, so it's mine is not meant to drive to California or go to Arizona or whatever. It's in town. 
But if you have a second car, like my wife has a standard Pathfinder, so that's the road trip car. And I yeah. drive around in my car 90% of the time, and the, the cost savings on it are just unbelievable. I'm just racking up, like, it's at least $1,500 in gas my first year that I didn't pay for. That's, that's just awesome. minimum savings beyond everything else. Yeah, I know my uh, my gas bill on my Toyota 4Runner is quite uh, quite large by the end of the year, especially with all the commuting I do back and forth at the strip for work. And absolutely, yeah, it's crazy, man. There was we had a one story at our last drive event where um, somebody worked at the Nevada test site, and they drive up there every morning. So it was like a hundred miles each direction. <sighs> and I think I think she had a Toyota Tundra. It was she was spending eight hundred dollars a month in gas. That's crazy. So for her, a brand new Tesla Model Three was saving her three hundred dollars a month just in gas. Yeah. So there there are situations where it's that amazing, and then you know others it's close. Mine I had very specific criteria. I had a list of the car's got to do this, it's got to have this, it's got to be this, and this car I have is the one that fit the bill. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I know we're getting closer and closer to the end here, and we wanted <laughs> yeah. to jump into some of this other stuff here, man. Uh, I know you. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the white evangelical stuff <laughs> and get a little philosophical. You know, I like to talk about philosophy and religion and everything like that. So yes, it's uh, you know, I obviously a long time with dealing in being in Christian music, and of course involved in church for many years. I now refer to myself either as a recovering or a deconstructionist Christian. Yeah. And it's it's been a thing. I, I Again, it was a situation where I thought my wife and I were maybe this rare bunch of dealing with this. And then we realized as we were moving through our thing, how there's just so many more people dissatisfied with their church experience and so forth. And... And we, I happened to be literally, uh, one day I was going to sit, uh, soak in the tub for an hour. So I brought my extra Echo Dot in the room, and I was just going to be like, you know, Alexa, amuse me. And so she's like, do you want to hear this? No. Do you want to hear that? Do you, would you like to hear a podcast? And I was like, yeah, let's pull up some podcasts. So it starts flipping names past me, and I hear one called Ear Biscuits. And I thought, well, that sounds like that would be funny. That would be amusing. So I'm like, okay, put that on. And it just so happens to be, and I, I wrote it down because this is the podcast that changed me. Episode 275, and it was called Rhett's Spiritual Deconstruction One Year Later. And it was basically these two guys, and their, their podcast is normally just normal knocking around, you know, do you think, you know, the types of coffee and cars and, you know, just anything. And But these guys were two big, big Christians their whole life. They were in the evangelical church. They were in, like, I think Campus Crusades. They did international ministries. And about a year before this, they were just like, you know what? Screw this. I'm seeing too much junk. I'm seeing too much this, too much that. And he did this whole podcast about why he's out. And it, it was first, it was amazing to hear everything because he had really did his homework and like compiled all these statistics and things. But just to hear somebody else tell their story, and it was like, oh, my gosh, it's not just us. Yeah. It's not just our church or it's not just because I grew you know, we were having these experiences in a southern church. It was like, wow, this is more than just us. And then, and then since then, we've seen all these places. Like there's Instagram pages now we go to often. One's like the New Evangelicals. One is called Science Jesus Memes. One's called Naked Pastor. I just found that <laughs> one. And they're they're talking about these things. And it's like in our case, you know, the best thing is to talk about personal experience. There was our church wasn't terrible. It wasn't abusive. We didn't have, you know, sexual assaults and we didn't have any of that awful stuff. It was just this, this thing of we're for the gospel. We're going to do these things. We need to have this. We need help doing these things. And people like us got so used for our talents and our abilities. And we happily did so for the longest time. But at some point you were just exhausted, worn out. And then at some point you may your usefulness to them suddenly reduces and you're non-entity. So like in our case, we were at this church in, in uh, the South for eight or nine years and then we moved out here for jobs. So I, we were out here for 12 years and we were still connected with them, still doing stuff, still doing all that. We went back as part of this technology uh, job that I took, technology startup there. It was like we almost didn't even come back. People w weren't really connecting with, you know, they'd say hi and kisses and hugs at church, you know, on Sunday and nothing else. And at times on this, this, especially this technology job, I would be gone to Atlanta or Ohio or places like that for weeks at a time. My wife's home alone. We don't have kids. She's home by herself. No one checks on her. No one does anything with her. 
They don't have her on the music team. Now, we started the record label with them. So we were a big part of the whole music ministry and all that. We get back, no involvement, no connection to it. And by the time we left, nobody noticed. And we've been back here roughly two years. I, I could probably count all the texts or contacts we've had on two hands with fingers to spare. It's like, you're just gone. You're just, and I saw a joke post on the other day. I, we were wholly ghosted. That's, that's <laughs> the joke line now. And it was, it became this, you're this disposable person and this true caring and community kind of disappeared. And the, the weird thing was our church had that initially. That was one of the great things about it. It was dysfunctional Southern church. It had kind of messy things about it, but it had a family. It had a community. And we watched them evolve. And we were we were even talking about really cool things. Like because of the technology company, it was kind of based out of things in, in the church. We were talking about dimensions and we were learning about platonic solids and we were learning about frequencies and multiple dimensions. So we were talking about things that you don't hear in church. So it was really cool and innovative. But at the same time, we were seeing this undercurrent of this dysfunction start to creep in. And like I said, by the time we, it's probably only been two or three weeks where we just had the phone call with him and said, hey, it's time for us to move on. Yeah. And then I, and then I hear, I'm hearing more and more. I had a friend from Minnesota um, who we were, got to talking about. And I said, hey, you know, I had just sent him a note like, hey, we kind of ended up leaving that church. And he's like, yeah, I'm done with church. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, what? So he's up in Minnesota and he had almost the same experience we did. So it's like, wait a minute, this is a much bigger thing than we realize. And so there's, I, like I said, I don't have another term for it. It's, they call it deconstruction Christianity because they're, they're going through and looking at, well, why is it like this? Why are we doing this? Why do we say we're all love and peace? And yet Sunday is the most racially divided day in the entire week in America. And why is it that white evangelicals are the ones that support Trump by far above any other group, they are the most supportive. It's something like over 80%. Yeah. And why is it, you know, and it's, so it's that deconstructionist thing that's going on that are looking at, well, why is it this way? Why are we shunning LGBTQs? And why aren't we supposed to be, you know, the, the religion of love and peace and acceptance and, you know, go back through my Bible and it's like the only harsh words I can find that Jesus ever had in the Bible were for the establishment people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, he cussed them out. He went and whipped a few in the in the temple last I checked. And he had compassion for the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the women with the issue of blood. And they, he was compassionate for everyone except those people that were in power. And it's like, I see none of that in the contemporary church. And I'm not saying it's every single you know white church, but it's a really mass trend that has just creeped up and there's a lot of people like us going nope not anymore yeah it doesn't really uh it doesn't really fit the the current narrative of the world where you know everybody's trying to tear down all these borders between race and sexuality and uh you know gender and all this these different uh concepts of of what identify you as you and just kind of uh open the 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 world up to just individual people are unique and they're they shouldn't be uh included in these these substructures these groups and and judged based upon the color of their skin or who they want to have sex with well i think that's i've always said that i, I it's a refreshing part of the work we do as stagehands because i i know there's that junk in our business in our groups too i mean it's it's everywhere but for the most part at its at its purest sense it's i don't care what you look like I don't care who you want to sleep with. I don't care which God you talk to. Yeah. Can you do the job and can I work with you? Do you have a, a, a workable personality? Those are the two criteria that matter in our business. Oh, I yeah. I don't care if you're Muslim and you mix lights. Who cares? If you're the guy that's come in and you can do the job and I can work with you, that's all that matters. That's the core of what matters. Yeah. So I enjoy that about the work that we do now doing the live events and doing over. I don't care. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you are. Let's let's do this right and let's do a great show. Well, yeah, and it's, uh, there's been some insanity out there with the other end of that spectrum where, like, they, uh, what is it, Southwest Airlines is promising that half their pilots are going to be either black or female in the next five years or something like that. Like, it's not going to qualify if they have the skill sets or not. <laughs> it's just like, hey, well, it doesn't matter what you are unless you're black or female. We're not interested in hiring you. Uh, you know, who cares how good of a fucking pilot you are? 
And uh, that's the dangerous oversteer. Yeah. That you overcompensate. And I totally get that. Believe me, I see crazy lefties saying crazy things and I see crazy right wing saying things. And it's like it's always the truth is somewhere in the middle. Yeah. It always is. And and making those efforts to go that way, making the efforts that, oh, we're do we have a blind spot of racism when we hire pilots? That's yeah. good. But like you say, just hiring them in because you happen to have the right skin tone or the right gender. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The qualification still has to come in there. Yeah. And probably should still be first. That's one of the things I do like about our industry. Although, uh, you know, it's uh, if you are female and you can keep up in the industry, you'll definitely get picked up a lot faster because there's there aren't enough females doing what we do. And we want more people in there that are female doing what we do. I mean, chicks have better hearing biologically. They, they have so, way better hearing. They're better audio engineers. They're nicer to work with, you know? Like, I, I prefer to work with a, a woman when it comes to, like, managing a room together or something like that, you know, as opposed to somebody who's just going to, like, yell and tell me what the fuck to do all the time, you know? Well, it's it's the the crusty, angry, like, stagehand guy that we, yeah. you know, the, the hell's angels on a day off. Like, that's what they think most of us are going to shows. And it's, yeah, that, that personality, that's the people skills that, yeah, women tend to have them. At least women in our field, in my experience, tend to have them better. Yeah. Where guys can be angry and pissed off all the time and somehow they s- still keep working. That's And maybe that's a bias that we, our, our industry has to work on. Yeah. You know, the, the crusty guys don't get to work. I don't know. But one of my one of my favorite stories about all all fairness being being there in uh, the audio engineering world is uh, my friend. She's a small Japanese girl, and uh, she went to go get a job as an engineer. And they're like, "Look, you're going to have to be putting speakers up all the time, right? So unless you can pick that speaker up and put it on this stick right here, because that's your job, right? I can't hire you as an audio engineer." And she couldn't do it. And he was like, I'm sorry. You come back when you can pick that speaker up. And she did a little exercise. She came back. She was able to put the speaker on the stick. And he's like, all right, fine. Now you can have the job. It wasn't, it's okay. You know, we don't have enough girls in the industry. We'll give you the job anyways, even though you can't do the job. And I was like, no, you you have to be able to actually function in this in this field. And, uh, yeah, I, a lot of respect. A lot of respect to my friend who went out and, and put in the effort to actually be able to pick that speaker up too. Yeah. You got to first and foremost still has to be, you got to do the job. Yeah. Second is that you're a workable personality that you don't grate ev- on absolutely everyone, especially the client. And then after that, then everything else shouldn't matter. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, uh, that's the truth. She's one of my favorite people to work with too. She's very organized, very well, uh, put together, man, you know, so you just put her in charge of all kinds of shit and, I'll just listen to whatever she has to say because yeah. she's definitely thought about it 10 ways from Sunday and she knows exactly what the hell she's talking about. If you about. got your ducks in a row and you're competent, you'll work. Oh, yeah. And you just got to, you know, people got to see you work. And yeah, if you're a little, you're a little Asian girl, yeah, you're going to probably have to like over like show that you're strong and do those kinds of things. But, yeah. you know, sure, you work work around your weaknesses or whatever to, to show your strengths. But if people see you working, if you're a good person, it seems most of the time you'll get work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I, I just like to see more of that going on out in the world, man. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of blindness to things lately that yeah. is just kind of ridiculous on, yeah, I don't know. Well, back to the, the spirituality thing for yeah. once. I think for a lot of people, the whole political climate, the last several years has also brought some of this to a head. And it was our case in Alabama. I, if we hadn't already left to come back here for work, we would already be gone because of some of the the same things we saw and and experienced. And it was, it was like, there, there was this thing in the church. This is another crazy thing that we experienced that there were people out there, there are prophets and whatever people who were claiming and declaring that, that Donald Trump was put in by God. He had a special purpose and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, almost like a savior type figure. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, and many even predicted he'd stay in for eight years. They're all eating their words now. But uh, the interesting thing that I kind of found with that was, well, number one, the disconnect with uh, his behavior, his speech, his all of his things. And somehow you reconcile that with your own personal faith. But I actually I counter a, a proposition on that. And I say, maybe he did have some some God factor in being put there because the one thing he did, I call him the great revealer. 
because everyone who's racist, everyone who's sexist, everyone who's homophobic or whatever now feels the permission to just come out and say so. Yeah. So now we know who they are. And now, if necessary, we can avoid them. Yeah. So in, in one sense, okay, did he have a, a godly purpose? Well, maybe it was just to weed them all out. So we, the rest of us know who they are. Well, he definitely exposed a lot of uh, corruption and bullshit in the uh, government as well, which was nice to see a lot of a lot of people get what they had coming to him. I think a lot of more people got away with uh, freaking murder and, and so much theft of our tax dollars, and he wasn't able to get at him fast enough. But no, I'm I'm still waiting to see how the, all the fallout from you know his court cases and all that's going to be. But it was interesting. Um, I read there's this one book, like I'm not a big book reader, but I found this one book and I read it cover to cover and I'm in the process of about to read it again. And it's this book called American Nations and it was by an author named uh, Colin Woodard. And it's about the 11 different uh, cultural influences that North America has had on it throughout the centuries. And it's talking about people coming from England, from Scotland, of course, the native tribes, you know, here on, on the continent. And I'm trying to remember all the others, but they talked about their influences and their cultural impact on the country. Of course, um, Latin America, that was another one. Um, and they talk about how these, their belief systems, their this and that. And all I could think of is over and over reading through that book, I would suddenly sit back and go, oh, now that makes sense. Like, for example, one was a group of people that came from England, and their whole thing was they wanted to reestablish England on the American continent. So they wanted the exclusive ruling class, and they wanted the peasants, and the peasants should be lucky that they eat, and we have all the good things. And this was a group, um, I forget the name of the group, but they settled in basically to the area of Washington, D.C. Does our federal government suddenly make a little more sense now? Mm Mm-hmm. Because they see themselves as this elite ruling class and the rest of us are just peons who should be happy. Well, that's sort of what we're stuck with, you know. We're, we're stuck with more of an oligarchy than an, uh, a true democracy, man. You know, it's, it's all these people that have the money that can actually put their name out there and advertise and get, you know, the votes that are required to take these political offices as opposed to more of a, a draw-by-lot kind of system where everybody, it's almost, it would almost be like uh, in ancient Greece, right? It would be you get a lot. You get, you get, it's like jury duty. And now you're in charge of a certain political position, and you're going to do your best. It's not going to be great, but maybe the next guy who draws a lot does a little bit better. But it's not this, you know, the same insane people being in charge of our government for decades, and there's no accountability to it. They have the money. They can keep getting in. You can't compete with them. You know, and they play these dirty tactics and they'll just demolish your your credibility and everything like that. And so we're actually stuck in this crazy oligarchy where we're, we're ruled by this elite class of people. And it's not really a true democracy or a true republic anymore. Right. And it's it's like it was said, I think the founding fathers intended serving in Congress and things like that is like civil service, like jury duty, like yeah. whatever. You did it once, you did it twice, and then you went back to your normal life. Well, we've turned it into this career thing where people are in their 50, 60 years. I think term limits are the number one thing that should happen. They'll never happen because guess who has to pass that? Yeah. Congress. So it, that's that's part of the problem with it. But again, the, the cultural influences you see when you go through this book and you see how these different cultures live and how they think different ways of like freedom and liberty meant completely different things to two different groups in those in those early regional groups but the the craziest thing about the book and it was in like one of the very last paragraph or last chapters of it it was the book was written in like 2011 but i think i have a quote here i'm trying to remember if i got this right he's talking uh, basically in the book he's talking about how the united states is really this this tenuous sort of union because of all these different groups and their different priorities and their different so forth. And he talks about things that could potentially break up the United States. And uh, I, I got this pretty close to a quote. He says, basically, we will not survive as a country if we end the separation of church and state or institute the Baptist equivalent of Sharia law. Yeah, that's one. And then he says, if presidents appoint political ideologues to the Justice Department or this to the Supreme Court, or if candidates try to win by preventing people from voting. All I have to say is go look at the last year. Yeah. It was written 10 years ago, and the guy predicted several things that have, were happening almost as we speak. 
And so that's why in certain ways, I'm like, I'm not even sure the United States of America will exist in its current form in 10 years. Because well, it's just these an experiment. Things it was a great experiment. We had, yeah. a, we had a great run, but it might suddenly be there's a South again. And there's a this and a that. I don't know. We could break up into multiple groups. It wouldn't surprise me if it did. It'd be great if we didn't. But we'll see what happens. Well, I think, uh, honestly, they've been uh, they've been working more and more on dismantling your ability to buy ammunition and, and fucking with the Second Amendment. And now, you know, fucking with the First Amendment and your ability to even say anything and just dumping all your tax money into the military industrial complex so it's like i don't think we have much of a choice it's it's actually turning more into this uh false or uh, like dictatorship almost where the office of the presidency is just a farce i mean now it's totally a farce i mean we've never had more a clear puppet in the office than joe biden who doesn't even know what day it is or who is who is uh you know political uh, appointees are you know, he's just, he's clearly just like this corporate puppet who's going to do whatever he's told. And it's always been that way. Even, I mean, you'd listen to Putin talk about it. He goes, it doesn't matter who's sitting in that chair. He goes, it's those people behind you that are telling you what to say to me, because those are the people that are really in charge, which ultimately end up being these corporate conglomerates and these billionaires. And they're the ones really pulling on the strings and really putting the boot heel down on us and taking our rights away one at a time, one at a time until we can't stand up for ourselves anymore. And I'm going to be curious. I mean, I, I do find like the, the current administration, of course, a deeply refreshing change just from the issues of the rhetoric and from the other stuff. Yeah. The part I worry about is what's really under the skin, what's really happening. I mean, the, the, call for more workers' rights and the call for things like that, I absolutely see. And of course, being in our industry, I absolutely applaud. Is there always another agenda? That, that has become the problem in our governance is what is always the underlying agenda and who is driving it? Because I, I'm like you, I'm not to the point anymore where I don't think the people that we know their names are the people that are driving those agendas. And why are they driving those agendas? And, and how do we stop that? I don't yeah. know. It's, uh, I don't think we can stop it at this point, man. I mean, we can't really. The closest thing that ever came to it was whenever all those people started storming the Capitol, and that didn't last long enough, you know? That just got shut down, and now all those people are going to pay a high price for that. And it's like that's the whole reason that the Second Amendment's in the Constitution in the first place is so that we can overthrow these people by force because that's where it's at now. And unless we do overthrow people by force, unless we do show up in mass with all the ammo and guns we can come up with as a militia and say, no more of this bullshit, okay? We're, you're all gone. We're pointing new people to, the, to these offices and all this corruption and greed and lobbying and, and no term limits. And you're just, you're just yep. you know, it, it has to go because it's, it's but it's, it's either going to collapse in on itself, like you were saying, and the, the government, the United States government is just going to fall apart or, you know, there's going to be this new world order with all the crazy shit that Bill Gates is doing, taking over all the farmland and Monsanto and just uh, it's getting really scary out there. And this whole uh, this whole grip of your rights, your freedom, what you're allowed to do, what you're allowed to think, what you're allowed to say. Um your ability to stand up for yourself in those situations is all being taken away one piece at a time. And I think I think some of it has been raised by certain issues, like it's the old um, Supreme Court's uh, judgment or ruling that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Yeah. So at what point does free speech become lying, like in the case of elections or in the case of certain things or all the crazy, uh, I'm sorry, was it Jewish space lasers? Was that the thing? The one chick was trying to, anyway, I don't know. you know, at, at the point, when does, when does, when do lies become censorship? When are they remain free speech? When do they? And I think that, I think more than any of that is the fact of the American public's inability to discern truth from lies from this, you know, from a certain media influence or certain sources where they get their stuff and being able to go. Yeah, that's I don't believe that this seems like a more credible source, like like discounting science yeah. regarding vaccines and regarding, again, from where I was, lots of anti-vaxxers, lots of crazy stories about computer chips and whatever. which is ridiculous. Uh, I, I love when people say they're going to put a computer chip in your blood and they're going to track everything you do. It's like, can I see your cell phone real quick? 
<laughs> oh, so you update your Facebook every five seconds, and you carry a GPS locator around with you that has a microphone and a camera that's on all the time, listening to everything you say and constantly co- recording everything, and the NSA is keeping track of all that. But they're going to put a microchip in your blood. Well, I did actually, that was one I got into because of working with the tech company. Yeah. And I did a lot of research with like the patents and whatever. So I, I dug into that conspiracy theory. And here's what I found out. Bill Gates is working on public health. That's part of his his things. But what he was working on was a silicone chip, not a silicon chip, because in places like Africa and third world countries, they don't have banks because they don't have IDs. They don't have IDs because they don't have a paper trail. So how do you keep track of who got diphtheria, who got tetanus, who got, you know, the the immunizations? So the invention or the patent or whatever he has was for a silicone chip chip to be inserted under the skin and that it would be color dyed for the certain whatever. So if you got diphtheria, you got an injection of dye in it, and then they could go over it with some kind of like an UV light or something, and it would show, oh, okay, you've got diphtheria, but you need such and such. So that was the system. So that got distorted from silicone, silicone rather, to silicon, and because of him being at Microsoft, that's the origin of that conspiracy theory. Yeah. That's where it all came through. And it was like, just a, it's just a misunderstanding. It's like, look, you've been to the strip club, right? You know silicone. <laughs> and you have a computer, you know silicon. You just have to understand the difference. Yeah. And yeah, so, and, and that's a lot of those kinds of things. Again, they get their misinformation from one YouTube video or one sketchy website, and now it becomes truth. And I've seen it become, especially like in the case of QAnon, and again, far left has it. I just don't know if they have a name necessarily, but where they, they take one belief and it, facts don't matter. Yeah. Doesn't that sound like crazy religion? Yeah. Doesn't that sound like cult behavior? And that's what we see happening. We see more of that polarization, people going to crazy theories. They're, it, they're leaving the church and going to these other churches, if mm-hmm. you want to call them that, to these other belief systems. And it's like, again, the truth is somewhere in the middle most of the time. Well, and it, the problem, I think, with a lot of people is that they, they have to be right all the time. And it doesn't matter what they're right about as long as they're right and they know they're right and they'll they'll punch you in the face if, if you disagree with them right and it's like the uh the antifa people punch a nazi and it's like he wasn't a nazi <laughs> you've never met a real nazi you know like you're just fucking hitting people because they disagree with you and uh and it's just like you don't know what you're talking about nobody really knows much of anything at this point you know anytime you try to go and establish an opinion or do research you're always uh smacked with confirmation bias and uh i can pull up 20 pages for and 20 pages against every argument you can make now and who knows how many of those are uh you know just bullshit websites being put up how many of those are actually based on real scientific research and it's like you have to just backtrack and backtrack and backtrack to who owns the websites and where it comes from and and there's just so much disinformation going on now right that really the ultimate stance you have to take is i don't know i don't know and i can't take a hard stance on any of it because i can't tell you where the information i got is legitimate or not you know it's 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 I feel like some of it seems legitimate, but I'm not going to hate anybody or take a huge, huge, you know, stance against everybody based on this insane age of disinformation that we live in. And the new wrinkle, of course, now being social media. Yeah. It wasn't, disinformation wasn't so easily distributed. You did have media outlets that were, by argument's sake, more reliable, more uh, uh, credible and now you have this, again, division between left and right and all these other things. And with social media, this is where I said, like my concern as well is that the First Amendment's probably going to get stomped on a little bit. It got Be- stomped on the second the second Biden got elected. The First Amendment got shit all over when they banned every conservative voice on the Internet and they shut down Parler. They were like, oh, well, there's a place where conservatives can go to have their opinion and they just shut it down. I was blown away that Amazon did that, by the way. Amazon Web Services shutting down Parler just because they have a difference of opinion than these people. And it's like, okay, but that's not your place, man. You know, they're they're allowed to say whatever the fuck crazy bullshit they want to (laughs) say. And And it is. It is. At the same time, it's also, are you going to let confirmed lies yeah. go through and stir up, you know, stir up. Obviously, you know, Trump is still banned on Facebook, yeah. you know, and the the argument basically is that he stirred up an insurrection based on lies. So 
it, the line of lies versus truth, First Amendment versus not, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of battles in the next few years, right or wrong, left or right, because of those very issues. Can I go on there and say aliens abducted me and do this and that? Yeah. Of course I, can. I can, but can I say that the last hurricane was caused by blah, 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 and this and that, and it was space lasers causing fires? Yeah. With no basis. But can you, you know, again, but if you're- Yes, you can. But if that's you're- That's what create, the First Amendment's for. And that's, and that's the debate. But can you yell fire in a crowded theater if it causes a panic, if it causes an insurrection, if it causes, where's that line? And that's mm. where, I wouldn't want to be a judge. That's all I can say. Well, that's that's more of a social construct, yelling fire in a crowded theater or yelling bomb on a plane. That's a that's a social construct. That's not so much a First Amendment issue. Whereas you, sh the second you start saying you're not allowed to say X, right? Anything at all being put in that place is the end of is speech in general. Because the second you take one thing away from one group, then another group wants something taken away from another group. And then you have what's going on in, like, say, Canada right now, where they put in racial laws where you can't say racial slurs or whatever, uh, punishable by law. And they started adding the pronoun argument into that. So now in Canada, uh, they have it on the books where... Uh, you are, they're voting it in or something. I'm not positive. I know Jordan Peterson is fighting it tooth and nail because it's ridiculous. If I don't call you the pronoun that you feel like today, there's legal repercussions for that. That's ridiculous. And I, I, again, like you shouldn't be calling, you shouldn't be disrespectful to people, but so what, you know, people, people are people and everybody has the right to say whatever the hell they want. And you have the right to take it like a bitch or, you know, like <laughs> uh, just go, okay, well, I don't agree with you and move on with your life. But, uh, you know, you can't force people to say a certain thing and you can't force people to think a certain way. Sure. And that's, of that's where it all ends up. So now they're going to do, so where does it end? Right. So the pronoun issue is going to get through, right? So now you can't say this long list of words or you have to talk a certain way and that's going to continue to go down the line. Until there's just this crazy dystopian world that we're living in where you have to walk on eggshells. I mean, right. it's even happening now. Like when we were having the conversation earlier, uh, I was trying not to say anything super offensive, even though I was saying something totally legit about my friend who couldn't pick up a speaker and then who could. Right. And it's just like, how do I say this? And I'm like kind of stumbling over my own words as opposed to say, just getting to the point and saying the thing because, oh, I'm going to have a bunch of people pissed off at me because I didn't say it the right way. Right. And there is there's a general level of respect that you can give. Nobody's ever going to get it all right. It's yeah. uh, absolutely agree on all of that. And it's like I said, I'm glad I'm not a judge. I'm glad I don't have to make these first First Amendment decisions and and those kinds of things. But it's it's a scary time. I think it's we're in a very important time because all these issues are coming up because of, you know, the last very contentious presidency going into this one, which are you know, politically, diametrically, the way that, you know, their behavior, their manner, their mode are, couldn't be almost more polar opposite in, in so many ways. There's going to be some tears. There's going to be rifts in between here. And so it's going to be a weird year. I, I predict the, the 20s are going to be like the, the 60s or the 70s. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a lot of ugly and, and I don't know. I don't know how it's going to all end up, but it's, it's going to, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. And it's, I think the funniest part about the whole thing and the most ironic part about the whole thing is historically, it's never been a better time to be a human being on this planet. We've never had better health care. We've never had more access to food and clothing and shelter. Our, the technology is so out of control that, I mean, it's become an addictive drug for people. Yep. And uh, we're solving every virus and every disease across the planet. I mean, the things that are happening in Africa right now, uh, where they're bringing clean water to all these villages. And it's, it's just never been a better time to be alive, no matter who you are. And everyone still wants to say it's terrible. And, oh, well, it might be great for everybody else, but not for me. You know, it's like, you don't know my story. And it's just like, everybody's life sucks, man. Life well, is suffering in general, man. You wake yeah. up in the morning, it sucks. It's almost um, a, a, 
uh, a tribute to how good it must be if we can have legal arguments over which pronouns I get to use. Yeah. In, in that sense, it's got to be that good because we're not worried about nuclear annihilation. We're not worried about, you know, those kinds of things, at least right now. But it's if, if you can have those kind of conversation, that be the top of the arguments, it must be going pretty well for a lot of us. Oh, yeah. Could it always be better for all of us? Of course it can. There's a lot of issues. The, the you know, the mass accumulation of wealth and is that right and or what should be done about it? I have no earthly idea. Nothing can be done about those. Mathematically, there's always going to be 20% of the 20% of the population are going to control 80% of the wealth. Mathematically, we can reset it a million times over and over again. If you allow things to run in a free market system, that's how it's going to end up, man. So it doesn't matter, you know, you got to just get over the fact that somebody has more than you because someone will always have more than you. Someone sure. will always have less than you. Someone will always have more than you. The world isn't fair and it'll never be fair. And trying to make the world fair only fucks up literally everybody's <laughs> life. You, you're just all you're doing is screwing everyone who works harder than you to make somebody who doesn't work as hard as you have the same life as them. And it's like, well, maybe they don't need that life if they really needed it they'd work harder for it you know or yeah uh it's or you know there's just all kinds of different uh, variables that go along with it but it's like you're it's not going to be across the board everyone has the same exact thing and who wants to live in that world anyways that's a ridiculous world to live in where where, where do you get inspired where are your aspirations where is your uh uh, what's it called? There's a word for it, but yeah, I'm, I'm fucking missing words. So, you know, where's your uh, desire to build and be a better person? If right. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter what you do, every, it's just going to be handed to you and everybody's going to get the same, the same thing no matter what you do. Right. And, I, and I've seen, too, that, that that can be affected, too, by different cultures. Like I've heard the story when, of course, when the mask thing came up, they were talking about, well, you know, Asia, Jap I think Japan in particular, Wore masks all the time. Yeah. People wore them all the time. And it was because, uh, and somebody tried to explain it to me that in at least Japanese culture, the community is the priority, not the individual. So it was, if I'm going to protect other people from my thing, that's why they wear masks. And here we're much more about individual rights and so forth. And there's a, the question, has the individual right thing gone over balance? Or are we pushing too hard now for the communal thing and we're leaving all the individual rights people behind? Again, it's, yeah. it's big battles that I'm that are big too big for me. Well, society is just a collection of individuals. It's not a tangible thing. You know, there's buildings yeah. and there's a group of people that live in those buildings in this place where we put a fake border, an imaginary border around. But right. the, the society in general isn't a tangible object. It's the individual is all that there ever is going to be, man. And sacrificing the individual for the sake of something that's not real, it's just, it's a futile effort. And every time that that's been implemented in human history, it's led to massive, massive amounts of death and suffering and starvation because the individual is all there's ever going to actually be in a tangible existence, man. Uh, and... We need to cater to that ideology. We need we need to cater to the fact that everybody needs to have a good life individually. Right. Everybody needs to be able to strive for the pursuit of happiness, whatever it may be, to that person, and not be constricted by this this concept that you don't have the right to offend people with your words, or you don't have the right to infringe on everybody else. It's just like, yeah, but. They don't have the right to tell you what you have, what you're allowed to say or do either. You know, as long as you're not harming somebody physically or taking away from somebody, you know, stealing or raping or killing somebody or assaulting somebody in a physical manner. I mean, OK, this, you know, you said something that hurt their feelings. Big deal, man. Well, and, know, and, and I would argue, too, the best comedy out there most of the time. Yeah. Is the offensive stuff. Yeah. And it's it's not because it's offensive for the sake of being offensive. It's if it causes you to think. And if it's like, why did that offend me? And why was that particular issue? You know, or whatever. So it's it's kind of in that same idea. But I'm going to I'm going to kind of throw something at you as far as that individual versus community thing. Yeah. Because we can deal with we can uh, identify this in a very small way. Sim back to music, a band. How many times have we mixed a band or worked with a band and you know the chemistry isn't there? Oh, yeah. And, and, and chemistry, again, intangible, invisible, you can argue, doesn't exist. But we've also all worked with bands that have the chemistry and the ones that don't, and we know we would argue it's tangible. So 
almost if you a community to me is taking that concept larger. There's people with shared ideas, shared values, shared community. Get us into problems? Yes, that's where dysfunctional churches come in. That's where dysfunctional communities come in. So it's like there is a value to it, but again, how do we assign it without impinging on the individual and the in- individual impinging on the community? That's why I'm here and I'm not in a White House somewhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, gonna, that and you you weren't born with a silver spoon in your freaking mouth and you don't have millions of dollars to, you know, blast your face on every publication and all over social media and television and, you know, otherwise you could go sit on your ass and let lobbyists tell you what to vote for. Well, when I can't, like, stop talking or I can't shut up about something, I have a Facebook page. I call it the Fierce Independent. <laughs> and my goal is to equally offend both sides of, of spectrums. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing. Like, uh, whatever. Of course, it was mostly about politics in last year, but it's that same idea of like, look, we got to talk about this stuff. That's the number one problem right now is we're so polarized that there's, it's almost impossible to have conversations from the opposite side of the spectrum and do it respectfully yeah. and do it. I understand this is where I see the disconnect or this is where that's why even things like this is great. I mean, I know we're not 100 percent eye to eye and on all these things, but we're talking. Yeah. But who should be 100 percent eye to eye on that? Right. You know, if well, everybody's walking around with the same mindless thoughts in their head and nobody has a difference of opinion in anybody, what fucking world is that, man? Exactly. And that's part of the flavor, the culture, you know, America, the great melting pot. We, yeah. we should have those those varieties. And it's, it's just that somewhere we seem like we're all the way too far out left and right. And we've got to we got to bring some things back in. And, and how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. But I'm at this point, I'm not even sure if it does. Well, I mean, eventually, eventually people will get uh, to a point where they realize this shit ain't working. Yeah. And uh, hopefully they start coming to a place where we can actually have these discussions with each other as opposed to just screaming and yelling and and demanding that you're right and that everything you feel is the truth should be brought into law. You know, it's like that things being brought into law should be a big deal. Yes. Not just like a whim or like a, a touchy feely kind of thing. It should really make sense in a logical, in a logical stance, man, because now it's enforceable and punishable and you can have your rights taken away from you based on someone else's feeling. Right. Like going back to, you know, being involved in the church. You know, we had a lot of people that were like, we need to bring America back to the old values and we need to bring it back to this and that. We need to bring it back to the, the, you know, Bible, uh, biblically centered, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, so how is that different from the Taliban? <laughs> they, they have a different book. They have a different set of rules, but yeah. isn't that exactly what they want? It's like, that's a touchy world you want to be in. I understand values we want to bring back. I understand issues. But when you, when you put it in that context, it's like, you're asking for Sharia law. You're asking for that. And that's, I, I can't go with that either. No. For the same reasons. Well, that's the beauty of like separation of church and state. You know, those, those people can have their opinion. They can say whatever they want, and they can live in their own moral guidelines, man. They can live their own life based on whatever religion they believe in. And I, and I think religion's a great thing when it comes to moralities and values and, uh, you know, how to kind of have this central focal point in your life that guides you in a good direction. But right. it's like everybody isn't going to fit into that same mold. You know, Christianity has its people that love it, you know, and so does... Islam, so does Judaism, so does Buddhism, so does Taoism, so does Confucianism. It's just like there's a lot of different flavors out there and there's a lot of different people out there and just saying that one set of moral values is the right set of moral values, that's where the problems start to come in because who's actually right, you know? Right. And it's it's the same thing I always say is like nobody really knows any of this shit. <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> right. If they're right or not, that's what belief is. You get to this point where you can't say, I don't know something. So you go, well, I believe this is true. I believe in this religion because you don't know. You don't know without a shadow of a doubt whether or not that's the truth or not. And right. so you just, you get the belief or an ideology around it, right? And that's, there's no way that you can take a society and force a society into that kind of strict structure and enforce it uh, uh, without totally infringing on everybody's right to be an individual and to be a person and to live whatever life they deem fit. Yep. 
I remember uh, a comedy bit. I think it was Billy Gardelli did a bit about that. And he said there are 40 thousand different religions on the planet he goes do you know what that means and i'm thinking he's gonna go all this other way he goes someone's gonna be wrong <laughs> he's like there's gonna be all these people sitting in hell yeah. looking at the other guy going Who, who'd you think it was it was the mormons <laughs> i think he said something about a frog or something but yeah it was it's that same idea it's like and i think america's in a unique spot yes we've had influxes of people from other countries over the years obviously irish and in latin america and blah 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 mostly Christian, mostly. Yeah. So now in the last few decades, we've had a more of a Muslim influx. Of course, we've always had a Jewish influence and, and more of that going on. So we've, we're seeing more international people come in. I think the, the America is kind of at a crossroads. It's like, okay, yeah, it was great at the beginning when we were 80% Christian or whatever it was, and we could, we could deal with it. Now, how are we going to deal with it when there's more of other beliefs and more of other things? And, and that's, to me, that's the genders. That's the, the different beliefs. That's the, you know, religious, political, all those things. It's like, okay, we have to learn to coalesce again. And yeah. that's supposedly what we were always good at. It was always a tenuous union, but that's what America, the great experiment has always been. And it's like, so how much, how much longer we got? Do we have another 100 years, 500 years, 10 years? We just keep going and, and try to keep it together and try mm -hmm. to bring things back. That's, I think that's all we can do. And as individuals, that's, that's part of our responsibility is try to get sane about this stuff again. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, uh, I think that's a great place to leave off. I've been trying to, I've been trying to do an hour for these podcasts. We went an hour and a half. I love it, man. Oh, you know, wow. we started talking and it just gets going and yep. the conversations are great. Um, but you know what? Uh, Paul Bordenkircher, thank you so much for being on my podcast. It was a blast. It's been fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, this has been To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Peace. Thanks for watching To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. You can check out more podcasts here and subscribe by clicking right here. We air new podcasts every Monday morning on Space Brain Station and all of your favorite podcast apps.